<clears throat> I do invite you to open your Bibles with me to 1 John chapter 2. Towards the back of your Bibles. We are in a verse by verse study through the book of Romans, um, and we will be entering into Romans chapter 8 next week. Um, one of the things that, that we as elders determined was just from this point forward, when we have a men's retreat or we have a women's retreat, uh, so we don't lose half of the uh, congregation as we're working our way through a book of the Bible, to just preach on a different text. Um, and so we're looking forward to getting back into the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8, beginning next week. Um, but that means I got to pick any text that I wanted to preach. Um, and so that's always a little bit fun. And I selected 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, for one reason, because when I look at Christianity as a whole, specifically Western Christianity, people who proclaim to be Christians, I think that this passage goes against what we so often see in those who call themselves Christians. Um, and so let us read God's word, ask God's blessing for the proclamation of his word as we work our way through it. First John chapter 2, beginning at verse 15. First John chapter 2, beginning at verse 15. The word of God reads, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all, that the, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desire. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the truth. Your word is truth. We thank you that we stand upon not our word, not upon Satan's word, not upon the world's word, but we have the more sure reliable testimony, the prophetic utterance of men as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, preserved for us in this book that we hold in our laps. And Lord, we confess that we don't care for it as we ought. We confess that we don't study it as we ought. We confess that we don't cherish it as we ought. Lord, even that we don't believe it, perhaps, as we ought. We ask that you would forgive us of this foolish attitude, of this wayward thinking, and we pray that by your Spirit you would create in us a hunger, an insatiable desire for knowing the Word and living in light of the word, first and foremost for your glory's sake, for we've been purchased by the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and secondarily, that you might use us to display your glory in all the earth until we behold the glorious one descending from above. In this hour, Lord, would you teach us by your spirit, would you make us lovers of you, and not lovers of the world. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. My concern in broader evangelicalism is really a shift from 30, 40, 50 years ago. And that shift is an emphasis on authenticity and not an emphasis on personal holiness. 
We need to be authentic Christians. We need to be genuine Christians. We must be authentic, genuine Christians. As a matter of fact, there's no such thing as a Christian unless it's authentic and genuine. So don't misunderstand me. But at the same time, we need to pursue personal holiness in the way and with the means that God has given us to do such. I think in some sense, again, in broader evangelicalism in the West, we've gotten comfortable with looking too much like the world, with acting like the world, speaking like the world, thinking like the world. And this should cause us to tremble before a holy, righteous God who explicitly says in his word, in this text, do not love the world. So that's my concern, is that too many self-proclaimed Christians look as if at times they love the world more than as if they love Christ. That they're not willing to take a stand upon the issues that God's word speaks crystal clearly upon because the, lo- the world might think illly of them. Because they, they might have a co-worker that, that doesn't go to the Super Bowl, Super Bowl party. That, that they might have a student who scratches her head and goes home and, and tells their parents that they might have a fill in the blank. Brothers and sisters, we stand upon this word and we ought not care what the world has to say about it. We must love those in the world. We must, preach, we must preach to those in the world. We must care for those in the world. But we must not shrink back when we think about the hostility and the possible persecution that comes when we stand upon the word and not the world. And in John, 1 John chapter 2, there's a crystal clear command. Do not love the world. So we get one command and we get two truths following that command to warn you and to warn me and to warn this church and to help us to wage war against worldliness. I would encourage you to drink deeply of this text, to memorize this text, to apply this text, because brothers and sisters, there's not one of us in this room that is oh so holy as not to fall into temptation that the world presents to us. Let us look at verse 15. John writes, Do not love the world or the things in the world. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Why would John write that? These are the type of questions that we want to ask ourselves when we read God's word. Why do you write that, John? And when we start thinking this way, it becomes pretty obvious, does it not? that there are those who who are Christians who are struggling with loving the world. That was true 2,000 years ago, and is that not true today as well? Really, the book of 1 John is a book about assurance. Those who who are questioning, those who are wondering, and as you work your way through the book of 1 John, you realize if you're abiding in Christ, if you're doing those things, if you're loving God, if you're loving the brethren, if you're abiding in his word and obeying his commandments, then you can have assurance that you're in Christ, that you are what you proclaim to be. He has, throughout this book, the idea of walking. This is the regular course of your life. Not that you're perfect, but more often than not, it's your desire to follow Christ. It's your desire to do what he says to do. And when you fall short, what do you do? You get up and you continue with that desire. You get up and you continue walking. Such an encouraging book for us as we think about our assurance in Christ. And he gets to this point and he says, do not love the world or the things in the world. There's two things in this first sentence that we need to underline and highlight that we might rightly understand. It's two words that are all over the place in the scriptures, love and world. Love and world. What does love mean? If you could uh, take a survey Go down to the pier this afternoon. Just ask people, what does love mean? 
What is love? And I guarantee you that you're going to get a plethora of different answers. Really, we're after how does God define love? What does God say about love? It's not an emotion. It's not this feeling that we get within ourselves. It's much more than that. I want to define it this way and then embellish upon it. Love is a deliberative exercise of judgment. A deliberative exercise of judgment rather than an impulsive action based off of an awa- a wave of emotion. Deliberative exercise of judgment. In other words, it, it connotes regard and satisfaction rather than affection. So when it tells men in Ephesians chapter 5, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, does that mean only when I'm emotionally high on the things that my wife has been doing and saying to me? No, that's not at all what it means. If love is an emotion, then brothers and sisters, we're in trouble. Love is not an emotion. It's an action. It's really a choice. Husbands love your wife. It's unqualified as Christ loved the church. If Christ's love for you is based on you, anyone comfortable with that? I know I'm not. Christ's love for us isn't based on us. It's based on himself, his character, a deliberative exercise of judgment. Before the foundations of the, of the earth, a specific people that he cast his special love on, a special choice on that he would redeem them. And there is not anything in heaven or on earth or under the earth that can separate us from the love of God. This is how God loves and this is how we're to love as well. Love is choice. Here it says, do not love. I want us to see what's going on in 1 John when we get to this verse. Notice in verses 12 through 14. There's a shift in the tense of verbs. Look at 12 through 14. 1 John chapter 2, 12 through 14. He says, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Notice what all those verses are saying, all those verbs in those verses are saying, that this is a reality that is completed that has ongoing action. These are are truths that we stand in. But then you get this contrast in verse 15, and it says, do not love the world. So so we have these realities that we can boast in, and we can say, glory be to God, I am safe and secure in the Lord. But then the very next verse, it says, do not love the world. In other words, we have entered into a beautiful and secure inheritance, yet our temptations have not ceased. And we've seen that in Romans 7, have we not? So love we must understand it is a deliberative judgment. It's an exercise of judgment. What is world? What does world mean? And really, once we get into verse 16, it helps us to define world as John is using it here in verse 15. John loves. John loves the word world. That word is used 187 times in the New Testament, and of those 187 times, John uses it 106 times. The next person that uses it the second most is the Apostle Paul. And how many times does the Apostle Paul use it? 47 times. So more than double the amount of the Apostle Paul, John says world, 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 over and over again. What in the world does he mean by world? What is he trying to do? And we have to be careful here, brothers and sisters, Uh, Because if you look in any good Greek lexicon, you're going to find, you look up this word cosmos, and there's a boatload of different definitions. John uses it in at least, and some people would argue more than, but at least in eight different ways in his writings. 
Eight different ways. And so what, what, what defines a word context? We need to understand what's going on in the context. What is he communicating here? The words around the word world will help us to understand what he means. So I want to share with you what those words can mean, what that word rather can mean. Sometimes the word world simply means the sum of all things that are existent in the present. John uses it that way at times. Sometimes he uses it very literally speaking about planet Earth. Other times he, he, he speaks of it as the habitation for humanity. He's sp- focusing on, on the reality that men, mankind, dwell upon the earth. Sometimes he uses it to depict a contrast between heaven and earth. God dwells in heaven while we men dwell on the earth. He uses it to speak of humanity. Sometimes when he says world, he's just talking about humans. Sometimes he uses it speaking of all of humanity, but with an emphasis on believers. We see that in John chapter 12, verse 47. Now we're getting into how he's using it in our text. Sometimes he uses the word world to describe that which is cursed by sin and thus hostile to God and ruled by the devil. Let me say that again. Sometimes he uses that word to describe that which is cursed by sin and thus hostile to God and ruled by the devil. And other times he uses it as a system of human existence with its earthly joys, its possessions, its cares, and its sufferings. These last two definitions are the way that John is employing this word in our text. And why do we have to be careful about how we describe or how we understand or how we define this word world? Because we all know John 3.16. Have you ever wrestled with that? In this text it says, do not love the world. But in John 3.16 it says, for God so loved the world. Have you ever just thought about that? How, aren't I supposed to love what God loves and, and hate what God hates? Well, in one text, it says God so loved the world. And in another text, it says do not love the, the world. What am I supposed to do with this? These are why definitions are helpful. Because he uses that word in various ways. The command is do not love the world, meaning do not love that which is cursed by sin and thus hostile to God and under the rule of the devil. Do not love the world, meaning the system of human existence with its earthly joys, its earthly possession, its earthly cares, and its earthly sufferings. Do not love the world or the things of the world. Look at 1 John 2. Verse 4, John writes and he says, Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Look at verse 10 of 1 John 2. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. So John tells us explicitly what not to love. Do not love the world. But he also tells us explicitly what to love. Love God and love the brethren. So that's the command, brothers and sisters. Do not love the world. One of the many things that I love about God's word, some of you are probably tired of me saying this, but it's so true. God gives commands, and in his grace, he gives us reasons. He gives us results. He lets us have insight into his character, and he says, look, I give you these commands, but it's not just because I'm some judge who says, do this, don't do this. It's because I care for you, and because I know if you don't Submit yourselves to my word. If you don't submit yourselves to, to my rule, if you don't submit, submit yourselves to my commandments, then it's not going to go well for you. And that's what we see as we continue on in this text. We get two monumental truths. And the first truth is this, is that the love of the world and the love of the Father are enemies. The love of the world 
and the love of the Father are enemies. Look at the second half of verse 15. John continues after the command. He says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Can you please listen to that? Ruminate on that. Think about that. Meditate on that. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That is a stark and startling statement that, quite frankly, sometimes we just gloss right on over. These are those texts that that we want to look and say, Lord, what are ways that, that in my life I might be inclined to love the world more than I love you. How am I expressing to the world that's watching that that I have a love for God, that I'm committed to God, that I've chosen God based on his grace rather than seeking the ways of the world? The love of the world and the love of the Father are enemies. In other words, there's an incompatibility between the love of the world and the love of the Father. Well, they don't hang out together. They're not friends. You ever hear, see zebras and lions hanging out? They're incompatible, brothers and sisters. You ever see Lakers fans and Celtic, Celtic fans hanging out? They're incompatible, brothers and sisters. Unless, of course, they're Christians and they know greater love. But in all reality, I mean, they don't go together is what's being expressed. It's foolishness. It's, it's mind-boggling if you look at someone who, who proclaims to love God, but all of their actions say the exact opposite. It doesn't make sense to us. It doesn't make sense to John. It doesn't make sense to God. James would put it this way in James chapter 4, verse 4. He says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Whoever wishes to be a a friend with the world makes himself an enemy with God. John goes on to generally spell out that which is in the world, which is not from God in verse 16. Continuing with truth number one, the love of the world and the love of the Father are enemies. He he says in verse 16, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. That word, in some of your Bibles, it may say the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, desires and lust. It's the same word in the Greek. And sometimes I think we hear that word lust and we automatically have negative connotations. Thou shall not lust. But in reality, that word is always qualified. It it always goes further than just thou shall not lust. Paul uses that word two times in a positive sense in Philippians chapter 1 verse 23 Remember, he's talking about his desire to depart and be with the Lord, but at the same time, he has uh, 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 an understanding that the Philippian church still needs his ministry. And so he says, I desire, it's the same word. In 1 Thessalonians, he also uses this word, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17, and he's talking about how he longs to see those in Thessalonica. He was so encouraged by the church at Thessalonica and their faithfulness and their submission to God's word. And so he has this great desire, he has this great lust to see them again face to face, but Satan had hindered it. But other than those two instances, every other time that term is used in the New Testament, it's with negative connotations. It's with negative connotations. The flesh here speaks of our fallen and sinful nature, sinful nature, Things that come from within ourselves. Things that well up within us. Things that rise up within us. We freely operate in the lust of our fallen sinful nature in this world, which is at war with the ways of the Lord. We know for uh, Galatians, I'll turn there quickly. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. He says, but I say... Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. 
For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. The works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So that's the desires of the flesh, those things within us that, within us that rise up. That, that there's a war being waged, and we've been empowered by the Spirit, if we're in Christ, to wage war against the flesh. We don't have to give in to the flesh, yet the flesh is evident in our day-to-day -day lives. And so he says, these are the things that are in the world in 1 John. First being the desires or the lust of the flesh, but then secondly, he says, the desires or the lust of the eyes. If the desires of our flesh are the sinful wants that flood us from within our very own selves, then the desires of the eyes are those deceitful enticements, those dreadful longings that flood us from outside of ourselves. Sometimes we want things internally, and so we go seeking them. Other times we see something, and then we want it internally. They play with each other. They encourage one another. They're friends. The idea here is when we highly esteem someone or something for its looks without rightly analyzing its true value. Can we be guilty of that? Something looks beautiful. It's sparkly. It's shiny. I like the way it's appealing to the eye. I think I read that somewhere. But we're not considering, we're not dwelling upon its value, its internal value. There's a lot of beautiful things in this world. There's a lot of freedom that we have in Christ to enjoy some of those beautiful things. But brothers and sisters, what we want to do is we want to train ourselves to consider the value of that which we behold. Is it worth it? Is it beneficial to me? Does this edify me and my brothers and sisters in Christ? So many things look so good, but there are so few things that truly are good. Look can be what? Deceiving. These are things that we know. These are things that the world will even say sometimes. But you put it into a Christian context, and we want to think, what does God think about these things? Because beauty fades away. Looks fade away. The nice, new, shiny paint job you got on that great, beautiful car, 30 years, it's going to be gone. What's the true value of the things that we place our eyes upon? We want to stop. We want to contemplate. We want to wrestle with what God th says about these things. For the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes encourage one another. So he says the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes. These are things that are <clears throat> in the world. But then he also says the pride of life in verse 16. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life. And what he's really dealing with here is possessions. He's dealing with matters and materials that men boast about while here on earth. As a matter of fact, that same word is used in chapter 3, verse 17, and look how it's translated. It says, but if anyone has the world's good, the world's goods, that, that's the same word for the pride of life, the world's goods. It's interesting when you spend a lot of time with people to just witness, just listen, just observe 
what it is that they talk about? What do they boast about? What do you boast about? Christ? Salvation? Redemption? Or are they these material possessions that are here today and gone tomorrow? I want to be careful here, brothers and sisters, because what I'm not saying is that God doesn't give us material possessions and that we can't give him glory for that. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is what's going on in your heart when you think about these things and talk about these things. That's what I'm trying to get at, because that's what John is getting at. We boast about a lot of things in this life. What does Scripture tell us that we ought to boast about? Christ. That's all we really have to boast about. So, so if you have a nice car, if you have a beautiful spouse, if you have great children, if you have a great job, if you have a name it, whatever it is, we need to turn to James chapter 1 and say, every good and perfect gift comes from who? I got nothing. Nothing to offer. Everything that I have is, is not from myself. It's from him who has graciously bestowed this upon me. And so when we think that way, we don't boast about the thing in and of itself. We boast about the one who gave us the gift. And we're humbled and say, God, how, how wretched, how puny, how feeble am I, yet you still bestow these gracious gifts upon me? And it moves us into worship. That's how we want to think about our possessions. I don't want to boast about the possessions in and of themselves. Notice of this list of three, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, the first of these two describe an unholy want of what one does not have. Well, the last, the pride of life, describes an unholy pride of what one does have. He gets it from both sides. We look and we want. But sometimes we have and we boast about what we have. This is how John describes all that is in the sin-cursed world wherein Satan rules. And he says that all of it is not from the Father, but is from the world. One of the things that I want us to, to grow in, myself included, brothers and sisters, is we don't want to confuse the gifts of the world with the gifts from the Father. We don't want to confuse the gifts of the world with the gifts from the Father. There are so many things that this world has to offer us. And as we progress and as technology advances, we see much more of what the world has to offer us than any generation that has ever been upon this earth. I, I love talking to men who are in their 60s and in their 70s and in their 80s. What was the world like when you were a 30-year-old man? What was the world like when you were 20? What was the world like when you were whatever? And to a T, they all talk about, we had to go searching for trouble. Now trouble's searching for us. We're in a war, brothers and sisters. And you know what the world's not going to tell you? Don't love me. The world's going to tell you, Come on, you can indulge a little bit. You have freedom in Christ, do you not? It, it, it's fun. It, it's all right. But the other Christian that you know is doing it. We don't want to listen to those truths. We want to ask ourselves the question, is what I'm engaging in beneficial, edifying, and glorifying to God? Because the world is never, ever going to be honest with you, brothers and sisters. You know who is honest with you? God. You know how he speaks to you? Through his word. You know what, we, what happens when we're in his word? Our minds are renewed. You know what happens when our minds are renewed? We uh, realize and underline and, and rightly identify the lies from the world. That's one of the many reasons why Jesus says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. That's one of the many reasons why Paul says, all scripture is God breathed, and it's what? It's profitable. It's profitable. For a plethora of things. So why? For, for what reason, Paul? So that the man of God might be equipped for what? Every good work. If we're going to rightly identify the world and understand its lies and the one who is ruling over this world, we have to be students of the word. 
We have to be, church. Because there's going to be a day when you're down and when you're out and when you're tired that one of those lies from the world sounds true. I'm on a tangent here, but I'm going to keep on going. Because one of the things I also want to underline is this, is that sometimes we individualize uh, our understanding and our study of the word. This is one of the reasons why the church is so important. Uh, We need one another to engage in this war. We need one another to lock arm in arm and say, let's fight, brother and sister. What have you encountered this week in, in your life that the world has offered you that you were tempted by? Do we have conversations like that? And if not, we have to start. Because another thing that I'm concerned about in the Western church is this. As we gather together on Sunday mornings, and we say, praise the Lord Jesus, as we rightly should. But our relationships never get deeper than that. We're not walking. We're not fighting together. By God's grace, I thank the Lord for for this church. Because I do see that happening here. And I do see that happening in other churches. But sometimes, we can play church. Sometimes we can come in and not engage in the deep things of God. We can not, not even have a conversation about what the Lord is doing in our lives. We must encourage one another to that end. And if it's uncomfortable, praise the Lord. Let it be uncomfortable. Because the more it goes on, you know what happens? It gets less and less uncomfortable. Let's get back into the text. Truth number two, which is our third and final point. So far we've seen that we can't love the world and the Father. We're told not to love it, and we see that the world, the world's love and the Father's love are enemies. But the second truth we have is this, is that the ways of the world and the ways of the Father have different destinations. That the ways of the world and the ways of the Father have different destinations. Verse 17 reads, and the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Does anyone need encouragement to do what God wants you to do? This is the verse you can go to over and over and over again. Look, the world, all that stuff, all of its desires, you know what it's doing? It's passing away. It's not going to be everlasting. It's it's not going to lead to eternal life. It's not going to lead you to benefit and well-being. But you know what does? Whoever does the will of the Father, he abides forever. He abides forever. Look at verse 8. John writes, at the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So in other words, we get this idea that the true light, that which is, he uses light over and over again to describe the holiness of God, that there's no blemish in God. The true light is already shining, it's already occurring, and at the very same time, the world is in the midst of passing away. It's already disintegrating. If we watch and if we look, we can see these realities that it's not complete yet, but it's happening, it's occurring. The world is passing away. And those consumed with the world those who long after the world, those who desire the things of the world, will also pass away right along with it. Please hear that, brothers and sisters. This text not only makes us check our own hearts, but it also should move us to evangelism. That there's a reality that hell And the afterlife is eternal, both for those who are in Christ and those who are not. Those who are not perish eternally. They don't cease to exist, as some would like you to believe. They're not annihilated, but forever and ever and ever, they're separate from God. If you have any love of God within your heart, that should move us to some extent to open our mouths. We know we trust God for salvation. We know that he's elect. But how does he save those who are to be saved? Through the proclamation of the word. Some people would argue the doctrines of grace, this this sovereignty of God stuff, uh, that, that just makes me never want to be a missionary. That just makes me never want to preach Christ. You don't understand. 
The sovereignty of God should be the motivating fact because it takes the pressure off of us and he just asks us to be obedient. (laughs) Just go and proclaim these things, these same things that saved you. Go and share it with others that they might be saved as well. You can't save them. I save them, but I use you as a means to proclaim the truth that does save them, so be about it. Sovereignty of God encourages us in these things. The doctrine of hell encourages us in these things. For those who are consumed with the world will also pass away with the world. And there is one type of person who remains. John would put it this way in chapter 3, verse 23. And this is his commandment. That we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. We have existence in this world but the nature of this world is transitory. In other ways, it will not last. And Jesus says, if any would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In Colossians 3, Paul writes, to fix our eyes on the things that are above and not on the things that are below. Are we doing that, church? Are we beholding Christ and his promises as he has given them to us through his word? Because if we are, increasingly we want to behold the things that are above and not the things that are sure to pass away here on this earth. For the majority of my time this morning, I've been preaching to Christians. And because this passage is absolutely impossible to enjoy, to be encouraged by, to submit to, unless you are in Christ and filled with the Spirit of God. So if there's anyone in this room this morning Maybe you're visiting. Maybe you, you, so a friend has brought you in. Maybe you're wandering by and you said, you know what, I'm going to go to that, that big building with that cross and redeemed. What does that even mean? I'm going to explain to you what redemption is. It's really simple to some extent. There's God, and he's created all that there is. And everything that he created is not only good, but very good. That was until the first man and his wife, Adam and Eve, rebelled against God. That's what sin is. Here, are Christians talking about sin. Sin is simply this rebellion against the one who created us. We rebelled. From that point forward, all of mankind has the curse of sin. From Adam's loins to the entirety of the earth. There's not one righteous. The Bible says that all of our righteous deeds are but filthy rags before God. There's nothing that we can do to make our way to God. There's nothing that we can do to to have a right relationship with God. But there's something that he did. Namely, he sent his beloved son, the second person of the triune God, into the world in the form of a man. Jesus of Nazareth lived a perfect, holy life. Never sinned, never a a bad thought, uh, never a filthy deed, never a, a wrong word. Everything that God the Father wanted him to do, he did perfectly. Everything that God the Father did not want him to do, he didn't do. That's the exact opposite of you and I. We need someone to live the life that we're called to live, but not able to do. And that's what Jesus Christ has done. What we see on the cross as he's nailed to a tree is he takes the wrath of Almighty God that we deserve, that we deserve. We we need to understand that, that because we've sinned against God, we deserve eternal wrath. The full weight of our sin was placed upon him, and God poured his wrath upon the man on the cross. Righteous man. The wages of sin is death, but a righteous man died in our stead. The God-man, Jesus Christ, On the third day, after being buried, he rose from the grave. And this is where we get to boast, brothers and sisters, because he defeated death. 
And he defeated sin, and he defeated Satan, that all who would find themselves in him, trusting in his person, trusting in his work, relying on him completely and totally for their salvation, could say with assurance, I am his, and he is mine. Therefore, there's now no condemnation. No condemnation for those who are in Christ. He ascended into heaven. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. And if you're not in Christ, you'll be found wanting. So on this very day, as you hear this text, do not love the world, what does this mean? How can I do that? Know that it's possible only through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He ascended into heaven and said he would send the Spirit of God that indwells every believer in Christ to not gratify the desires of the flesh, but to walk by the Spirit. So if you're not a Christian, I would beg you, and I would ask you, and I would plead with you to consider the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would call upon his name, that you might not love the world, but love God himself. In closing, I want to give you just a few texts to consider when we think about this command. Do not love the world. Because in reality, brothers and sisters, the world is in our hands. It's getting more difficult not to love the world, yet at the same time be encouraged because we're able not to love the world by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. So three things I just want to say and give you some text to dwell on this week. Don't love the world, but overcome the world. Don't love the world, but overcome the world. 1 John 4, 4 through 6. It says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore They speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The spirit of error is that spirit of the world. The spirit of God is the spirit of truth that if you're in Christ, you have. We overcome the world by the spirit. John, 1 John 4, 4 through 6. Second thing is this, do not love the world, but preach to the world. Do not love the world, but preach to the Lord. I'm going to be frank. Church, we need to open our mouths and proclaim God's goodness and his glory in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're weak in that area. I say that in love. I say that to encourage you. I say that because I know that God blesses an evangelistic church. And that doesn't necessarily mean by numerical growth, so don't misunderstand me. But God has called us to do namely one thing, to go and to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that the Lord Jesus had commanded. If you're not telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ and if you're not part of the discipleship process in a Christian's life, as Mark Dever would say, I don't know what you mean by saying you're a Christian. That's elementary for Christians, that we proclaim the good news and we disciple those who are in Christ. If you're not doing one or both of those things, you need to consider where you stand. That can look a lot of different ways. I'm not being a cookie cutter up here. I'm not saying we all need to go door to door with Pastor Jeff. That's not what I'm saying. That looks like in the household. That looks like in the workplace. That looks like a lot of different ways. But we want to ask ourselves, are we proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ And are we discipling those in the church? This is what it means to be disciple makers. So don't love the world, preach to it. To preach to the world, you must rely on the power of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through chapter 2, verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through chapter 2, verse 5. So don't love the world, overcome it. 1 John 4, 4 through 6. Don't love the world, but preach to it. 
encouraging text for you to meditate on this week, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through chapter 2, verse 5. And lastly is this, do not love the world, but love God and love one another. Do not love the world, but love God and love one another. And we see this encouraging text found in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. I'll read it in its entirety, and then I'll pray. John says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And this love of God was made manifest among us. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he is in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So, We have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also Love his brother. Let us pray. Father, take the truth I have been proclaimed.